today with all of you and these two wonderful artists. We're here to celebrate and talk about the show Atmosphere, which is new work by Kay Raffle Hosford and Nick DeVries. Um, here's a little bit about these two artists. Nick DeVries has been working in ceramics for the past 10 years. Nick studied at St. John's University, where in 2001, he finished a bachelor degree in art with a concentration in painting and ceramics. During his years in college, he also worked with St. Joseph Potter Jim Lasso, Lasso? Loso. Loso, thank you, where he developed a strong sense of design and balance, which persists in his work to this day. Since his college years, Nick has worked as a production potter for a local pottery, taught courses at the Edina Art Center and Northern Play Center, and currently lives and works in Brainerd, Minnesota, exhibiting his work throughout the United States. Kay Bradford Hospitz, pastel and acrylic landscape paintings are often described as contemporary regionalism. Brathel Hospitz, Brathel Hospitz is a signature member of the Pastel Society of America and has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin Stout in Studio Arts. Her works are in corporate and private collections around the Midwest. Her pastel paintings have been featured in the Pastel Journal, selected for the Dane Arts um, annual poster and calendar in Dane County, Wisconsin, and her acrylic paintings are included in North Light Books, Acrylic Works 2, Radical Breakthroughs. She works from her home studio in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, as well as teaching workshops throughout the Midwest. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great to be here. So, I'm just, just going to talk a little bit longer <laughs> uh, before we jump in and ask questions. Um, the two of you may have been admirers of each other work, others' work, but you've never collaborated together. I don't think you knew each other before this. Um, and it was really when I was thinking about, I like to give as many opportunities as possible for artists to be featured here who are in our stable. Kay's been with the gallery for 30 years this year. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. She started when she was very, very young. <laughs> and uh, you've been with us for, I don't know, how long? Since the gallery survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quite a long time, too. Not as long as <laughs> But um, I just, when I was trying to, I love pairing ceramics and paintings together for two person shows. And I really just felt like the color palette, the texture, there was a feeling about the work, this beauty and serenity that I thought would look really great together. And so that's why they are together. And atmosphere felt like a perfect title because Kay is obviously capturing the atmosphere and works so much about the transformation. So that's why these two are here today. Um, I wanna ask you, so both of you have been artists for a long time, but I want to go back and forth and ask you about the work in this current show and what, if anything, you think is different in the work here than what you've done in the past. And I'm going to start with you. Well, I did create everything for this show specifically, so there's nothing in the show that was created before you asked me to do okay. the show. Um, I've been a landscape painter forever. And um, the sky always plays a part, but I would say predominantly my works have been landscapes with the sky things. So these are obviously the opposite. These are skyscapes. And um, really it was based on, um, I, had, I had a two-person show last year in Chippewa Falls, and I had an idea to do three little pieces that were skies. And um, they didn't sell up that show, so I brought them to Teresa. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 Lucky us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and she, it was, you know, it's always gratifying to have, you know, you know if you're represented by a gallery, they like you, but but when, when someone kind of gushes about the work, that, that's really nice. And you go home like, oh. Um, and she pretty much gushed over those pieces. Yeah. So, um, so then I, that was, when she asked me to do the show, I thought, I, I want to pursue this further. I mean, do more of this type. Um, but I had to go back to the land as well. I just, there's no way I could have done many pieces of just looking up. I would have gone insane. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so they, they are definitely, you know, this this kind of a piece is very similar to what I would have done before, but there wouldn't have been as much emphasis on, on the sky. It would have been more of an emphasis on what's below the, you know, below the 
the yeah. atmosphere. Right. Yes. I feel like the 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 time that you took doing those just pure sky studies must have had an effect on how how incredible the skies are in these pieces. And I think it did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I actually um, I really had to like experiment with the, the techniques in order to get the proper to get things that felt ethereal or you know, transparent effect because it's a very opaque medium, right? Yeah. To you know, so just just playing with the medium to make those things happen, the clouds happen really did teach me a lot. Yeah. Well, the, there are definitely new pieces in this uh, in this show that are exploring some some design and making spaces that I haven't really delved into too much. Uh, my work is always sort of this evolution where piece to piece, day to day, things aren't moving terribly fast, but month over month, you know, weeks over weeks, year over year, uh, forms get a little tweaked, they get a little tighter, I'm changing something in the foot. Um, but the specific pieces in this show that are a little different are some of the pieces I'm exploring with carving. Not for the first time, but sort of for like the 10th time throughout my ceramic career to see if it feels right. When I was in college and I worked with Jim Loso, um, I learned carving from him. He carved uh, just beautiful porcelain kind of Art Deco and Art Nouveau works and used, employed a lot of different finishing techniques, uh, gold leaf, lusters, multi-fire, low fire, uh, a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily, you know, in vogue at the time or even now. Um, but so carving has always sort of been a skill I've built with him and really admired with him, but never felt like I had a place for it in my work. So lately I've been sort of stepping into that a little bit, seeing if I can, if I can do some carving that, you know, speaks to me, is simple, is not derivative of his work, and is not sort of, you know, too cutesy, I don't know what the right word is there, too, yeah. like, on the nose, and that can kind of fade back into the work a little bit, so it's not the most prominent thing going on. So, like this space here with the bird. Yeah, that's um, stunning. Yeah, the, the whole idea is to uh, build carving. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I love nature. I've always been out in the woods as a kid, uh, hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, just in my backyard trying to find, you know, critters under rocks and stuff. Um, so, you know, one of my other paths in life could have been a scientist or a biologist or, you know, naturalist in some ways. Um, art was always forefront. But so I've, I always connect, I've always connected with, with nature in, you know, very direct ways. And in other works, I think that reflects more subtly where the textures become uh, grasses or rain. Uh, you, I love satin and matte textures and finishes, which, you don't find a lot of really high gloss out in nature. Uh, it's often, you know, it's often drummed down into those other uh, other kinds of finishes. So, so this is a really neat way to kind of use some very simple approaches. I've done birds. Uh, there's a scarab, fox. You know, so just working with some uh, simple imagery, but really kind of again trying to push that back and to try to keep it in um, the kind of I mean, my work isn't necessarily as like deco or nouveau, but kind of keep it in kind of a arts and crafts style that makes sense for the work. Right. So, and you know, there's things like um, it's interesting because I also the the more time I spent with the work, installing it, and then planning for the show and getting the images, I real I I came to realize there were even more really good reasons to prepare the work that I didn't even realize initially. Like, I don't know, like your interest in nature. Instance, and that like that picture right there I love the way there's that repetition those really dark greens and then that reminded me of this field mm -hmm. and um and I love that and the two of you also have in common there's a really strong sense of place I think about being artists in the midwest and and I'm kind of curious about in your formative years becoming artists we all take different um, trajectories as artists to find our mature style. And certainly 
there's a strong, a really strong um, history of well, landscape painting in the Midwest and capturing the Midwest and ceramics in, we were talking about this the other night, the opening about in the Midwest and Wisconsin and Minnesota particularly. And, but there's a lot of um, um, uh, Warren McKenzie kind of wood fire functional. Your work is different than that. I think of you as being one of the people who are making your mark in this new generation of young Midwestern ceramicists. Um, but, and it's interesting you started as a paint, you were painting in college. Yeah. I guess I'm wondering, how did you come to clay? And then how did you come to this, this aesthetic? Yeah, so I came to clay. I was like the art kid in high school. I took all the art classes, but our 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 clay room was kind of a mess. I had some friends that encouraged me, like, "Oh, come on, we just get to mess around." And I was like, "Sure, I'll do it." And it was just kind of like clay at the wheel, and something clicked. Like I always was just working with pencil, paper, drawing everything I could, getting as many you know reps in with just pencil, paper, and eraser. I loved two D. And then the clay hit, and all of a sudden I was like, "Oh my gosh, three dimensions! Here we go!" <laughs> and it really clicked with me. And it was it, like I I threw a pot on the first day, and you know my friends kind of looked at me sideways, were like, <laughs> <laughs> "I give up. This is terrible. <laughs> we shouldn't have invited him." <laughs> um, so then I then in college I got back into clay as you know taking clay classes. Um, but I met Jim quite early in my college career and started to work in his studio. And so, and I learned a ton from Jim, carving, throwing, aesthetic design. He was a teacher at Elk River High School in, in Minnesota. And he just kind of treated me as an equal. I was this 19, 20 year old kid who had medium to mediocre clay skills, but he wanted my opinion. We, we talked about pieces and like, I integrated into a studio in a way that like, I didn't realize what was happening at that point in time. Yeah. And Jim's work was very non Warren McKenzie. It was very outside of that kind of classic, functional, utilitarian, straightforward um, ceramics that has a huge heritage and which I'm right. thankful for, but he didn't fit in that anywhere. He was doing uh, all sorts of different kinds of firing. He was low firing, he was high firing, he was doing some raku, he was carbon porcelain. Like I said, he was doing some chalk pastels eventually and then lacquering <laughs> over it. And he was just all over the place. Um, so you could see there's a whole bunch there's of, all there's this other stuff. things to do with this. And I didn't even know at this time that there was this like strong kind of tradition in Minnesota. So it's not like I was exposed to the one thing and then exposed to Jim's work and seeing these two things, I was just like, oh man, this guy's a madman and I love hanging out with him and we're doing all this other stuff. And then later I found out more about this, like the more tradition of uh, Warren and uh, the Menge tradition in Minnesota. And I had already kind of been influenced by Jim, but his influences also kind of lined up with some of the other influences I had already had in terms of um, you know, I was really into the Austrian session painters, um, more 1900, 1920, 1930 ideas and yeah. around art at that point in time already. So yeah, like I think it's interesting. Most people wouldn't necessarily pick up one of your mugs and think, "I, I, he was influenced by Egon Schiele." Or <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? It's true. It's very true. And I think one of the places that it shows up for me is like lines, edges, line and form. This like creating forms that have a really strong sense of line. That's, that's like Chile. I love that yeah. line work in his work. Yeah. Um, the decorative, yeah. the adornment, mine, mine isn't super decorative, but there is that sense of repetition, that little more leaning into the design space that Klimt might have been doing. Um, so that in terms of painting, that's where some of that interest kind of bleeds through. And I painted in college because I was doing so much play with Jim. And I was like, hey, I should do something else too. I've got this clay outlet. I'm making with him all the time. I'm in his studio and I'm learning a ton. I should paint. Yeah. So my, you haven't seen your show with the a painting show. Well, painting is the leader to UK. <laughs> so um, I, I'm wondering, I, I think when I first met you, you were working in acrylic on canvas. Oh, I was, okay. yeah. But I, I just think 
that somehow when you're in art school, it's much more just sort of an obvious thing to paint in oils or acrylic or something. Soft pastel isn't as obvious of a media. Correct. So how did you, what was your, what was your lead into soft okay. pastel and when did you become obsessed with the landscape? All right, well, um, I, even in high school, I was really lucky, like him, to have a really good high school art education. I was super lucky. Um, in fact, my 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 senior year of, my, of high school, my art teacher actually like cleared a spot because I could have graduated the first semester. I had enough credits, but um, we didn't have that option in our school. So it's like, what can I do for the second semester? So I basically just took retook art classes in high school. In high school, so he cleared a corner of the art room for me for for second semester, and I just had to be his TA for the junior high kids, which was a <laughs> learning experience. Um, and I'm an educator now, which is, you know, after that, that's really crazy, isn't it? But, um, um, but so I was already painting regularly. I even had my first commissions in high school. It was like dog portraits and that kind of thing. Um, I always loved the landscape, but, um, we, my husband and I moved out into the country in 1985, I think it was. Um, and we were surrounded by this beautiful farmland and, it was so inspiring. I was like, I felt alive out there, whereas I didn't feel so alive in the city. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and it became a natural thing to paint. I was an oil painter up until I took a pastel, and it was when my daughter was born, okay. who's here somewhere. Um, when she was born, I did not like the idea of um, oil paints mm -hmm. in the sink, um, in the studio space. And so, I mentioned that when I was in high school, I had played with pastels. They would have been the cheapo stuff that I let my students use. Um, but uh, my husband, being the sweetheart that he is, bought me a set of Rembrandt pastels, which is a reasonably good, you know, it was a good box yeah. set for Christmas or something. And I started playing with them and fell in love. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started playing with them and then, like, sort of we fell in love with that medium. And then I... Um, I took a workshop from a really well-known pastel artist at the time. Her name is Susan Krasinski. She's primarily a uh, portrait painter, but um, that was at the Gilman's in a big place a little bit in Rockford, Illinois. Um, and then I really fell in love with it, and it was within it was within days of finishing that class that I was just painting a pastel in pastel. Um, so I pretty much I still had one of those, but I didn't use them very much after. Um, but I, I got a kick out of mixing when he went to college. He painted because he'd been working his house. So when I I didn't graduate from college or didn't go to college after high school. So when I was thirty five, I decided to get legitimate and get a degree in art. Um, so I went to college at age thirty five with you no know, kids at home, and I I, I painted in acrylic, um, but I didn't touch my pastels hardly the entire time. But I almost majored in ceramics. <laughs> Oh, I did. I did. I had, my house is full of my ceramics. Um, and they weren't bad, actually, because of, they were, I was asked to continue in the program. Are your paintings all right? They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's, kind a, of an there's a few that's that's really, it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting Yeah, right. You make pots from the next one. I'll yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, uh, she mentioned I'm, a, I'm an educator or a teacher, but I, I'm always telling my students that what you learn in one medium transfers. Everything transfers. You learn, you know, there's something about working with three dimensions and understanding form that helps when you're a painter and vice versa, you know. Yeah, surfaces and absolutely. And yeah. So and you know, drawing is the foundation to everything. If we can, you know, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I have um, a quote from each of you. We have, just so you know, like they have no idea what I'm asking them. So <laughs> we, we don't get, we don't get we just to study and talk. <laughs> So th this is just, these are quotes that are online. I just thought they were particularly interesting and I thought it would be cool to, to bring them up and then extrapolate on them. Sure. So Nick, you said, finding this life as a potter has been a gift and I'm constantly striving to make pots that communicate a sense of balance and complexity so that through my pots, I may add something to this thriving ecosystem of life and play. So especially that end, some, uh, adding something 
to this thriving ecosystem of life and play. I guess I'm wondering if what you mean by that is, I think a lot of artists place them, not in an egotistical way, but we think about all the artists who've come before mm -hmm. us and, and that we're sort of carrying on legacy. Is that what all of them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, like I, there's some other parts that I've written and some other statements that, are, that touch on that too. The idea that like once I decided to, or even just dabbled in play for the first times, you don't, at that time, you don't realize like this sort of ocean or this river that you're stepping into, right? right? This That's idea a nice that, analogy. Like, yeah, you're like wandering into this place and eventually you realize it's not just a little puddle or it's a stream and it just gets bigger and bigger and more broad as you understand the thousands and tens of thousands of years of, of tradition, of ceramic tradition that sometimes overlaps or crosses or doesn't and comes up in different places and is divergent and convergent in different ways. And so that's like, in terms of like being part of that ecosystem, yes, it's like a historical. My work, I don't think of my work as like, I don't look at historical pots and gain inspiration there. Um, and then the other way I think of the word ecosystem is just the root word of ecology, meaning like a multifaceted, um, uh, healthy, like a healthy ecology means there are all sorts of different parts of the system that are, are active. Yeah. So in terms of making, yes, being in the studio is important. Making is important, but reading and gardening and biking and talking to other artists and like listening to podcasts and get, you know, finding not necessarily like individual points of inspiration, but I think of it much more as an organic life that just kind of surrounds me in my studio. And then all is a feedback loop of the work. That's a great answer. I love that. Yeah. 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 I've thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, good. I, I thought of something while you were talking and I just lost it, but if I can't Maybe we'll it <laughs> bring it back up. Um, the, because I think that your work has such a good sense of place also. You know, like it feels grounded in where you are, as does Kate's, you know. Is that? Yeah, maybe it makes sense. Um, it's, you know, one of the things that I've struggled with, and like, I'm a bit of a heady person, but it's hard to make a pot that doesn't have, that doesn't push a person in a direction in terms of concept. Yeah. And have that really push through. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I would like to think that on a whole, my work has a few directives behind it. It's going somewhere and it is rooted in my life and, and place too, for sure. Right. Like it is, I'm always kind of uh, juxtaposing some of those natural elements, those lines and textures that are found in nature, along with some of the glazing that kind of reads as lichen or washed out rain, along with some of this more architectural. I know what I was thinking was that both both of you I think do this, um, as do a lot of artists. What I I love I, I love all kinds of art, whether it's new media, new things that are being done we haven't seen before. But there's something about um, a new take on a landscape and a new and functional ceramics where one could think humans have been interpreting the landscape visually and making pots for I general you know. Eons, eons, long long time, long long time. <laughs> you would think, are there? Are, do we still have something to say? And we do. And and no one else. If the two of you weren't alive and hadn't touched these two media, these things, there's a twist. It's amazing that there can always be a new variation, um, and something else to say within these, within these agreements. So, um, okay. Um, you said, my work in soft pastel has been described as contemporary regionalism, a celebration of the land, but with a modern aesthetic. I am particularly interested in the concept of quiet anticipation, an expectant stillness that one feels at certain times of the day. Mm. And it's that that last little bit, the concept of quiet anticipation. Exactly. Talk about that. Well, um, I don't know if you remember, but the early years when I was in artisan gallery, my work was much more impressionistic. Do you remember? There were yes. more, much more mark making. Yeah. Um, 
which is actually the what you see if you go through like the pastel journal or something, especially with the landscape, maybe not so much with still life or portraiture, but you see it, impressionism and a lot of mark making is, is way more common. Um, I feel like an outlier a lot of times as a landscape painter with much that tighter mm -hmm. look. But um, I mentioned about living in the farm and um, about being alive. And my favorite time of the day has always been sort of the golden hour or those early dawn hours. And, and also, I, I love storms. I'm kind of a, I've had since I was a small child. And there's this sort of this, this almost like this like catch in my, like something's going to happen any second now, and I'm going to witness it. You know, just, I don't know, I get real emotional about it. But anyway, um, when I was working with a lot of mark making, I could not achieve what I was trying to say about that split second and something's going to change. It was already too active. I don't know how else to describe it other than that. As, as Hopper said, if I could say it in words, there'd be no reason to paint. Right. Um, and so um, I slowly, sort of like you, became more and more tight, or I think you used that word. My, my work became tighter and tighter because I was able to say that feeling of like, Oh, we're on the cusp of a change, where is it, or instead of seeing the change happen, we're already on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that, that sort of expectant, the pregnant moment or whatever has really influenced me all my life with my art. Yeah. Even in, you know, when I was doing ceramics. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> Sometimes when I do these talks, I, I was just realizing we're having these conversations that are all about your background and ideas and all that. Sure. And sometimes, you know, I ask questions about technique. Um, but I don't know, I haven't touched on anything like technical in this conversation and I don't in terms of clay, yeah, in terms of my work, um you know there are the most technical aspects are probably the glazing aspect. Yeah. Because I fight so I fire with an electric browser which means to get a lot of variation and a lot of interest and depth in the glazing, um, typically you're kind of forced to be layering glazes, to be using a lot of accent glazes, or to just almost like building maybe a background to a painting. Um, kind of an ethereal atmospheric background. And then what I'm also trying to do is I'm trying to pull out some of those natural elements, um, some of that lichen, um, and so I like it when my glazing, so that, you know, kind of obscures some of that texture or pushes a carving back. So the glazing is probably the most like technical in my mind because it involves chemistry and mixing glazes and stuff. Um, the other technical aspects, you know, like there, I've thrown a ton of pots, and like you can become a throwing technician, right. where like throwing becomes very simple. I mean, it's a very technical process in terms of skill building. Um, but one of the reasons I started squaring pots out is because I, I, so I worked at a production pottery for about nine years. And when I was there, I threw close to 300,000 beer mugs with that. So the throwing process initially is this sort of magical thing. You can bend what? There's this material that you can stretch out and turn into a bowl. And, and then after 300,000 of them, you're kind of like, <laughs> you know, I just happened to be listening to the radio accidentally making mugs. So the growing <laughs> process kind of lost a lot of that interest. Right. So that's why, you know, like the, that, you have to build up that technical skill to be able to throw, but then once you have, have it, you've done it a million times, then I was like, I want to square some things out. I want to work on surface. And yeah. joke I know so many really good uh, potters and ceramicists who have had a background in doing production pottery for a few years or however yeah, long. Sure. And it gives them this foundation of just because then you you've just got that and then you can just yeah you can kind of do anything with the clay yeah I can I can push it I can yeah. tell it to do what I want right yeah it's a great it's yeah it's the three hundred thousand beer mugs were found yeah they got there yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of soft pastel so. You didn't study soft pastel with anyone. You picked it up well, technically. I, 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 oh, you did. I did you with that one gal. Yeah. That one gal. It and was that sort of that, and then you took off. But then it was me, really, really experimenting. And like yeah. I said, I, I was more of an impressionist painter for years. 
Do you think there's anything you can do with the media that is unique in any way? I I think so. Yeah. I um, like I said, one of the things that first of all, you just don't see that many people working as tightly as I do sure. with the landscape, but. Yes, um, people people will come in and they'll say, "How does she get those?" Yeah, and even, or they'll ask again, "Is it really soft pastel? How does she get those little?" Lines? Well, my dear friend John Rebel, who's also a pastel artist, you know, he's a totally different style of painting, and he's always like, "Damn, girl!" You know, that's yeah. he's like, "How do you do that?" Yeah. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it's um, and and when I teach a I teach a class called uh, um, you know it's like a pastel exploration, trying to get people to to don't paint, not by what I call default, not working by default and just doing it, but to have, I, you should be painting with intention. Um, so, so many times people, no matter what their medium is, they just sort of like, they just start working and you know, that's how their style develops or whatever, but it might not be saying what they won't really want to say. And that's why I, I try to teach people techniques. And so sometimes just in teaching people techniques, I've learned myself, yeah. you know, about how to like, how can I make marks that's that that tiny? Yeah. I still, you know, read. Um, and I'm also it, uh, unusual in that I, I use fixative a lot. A lot of pastels do not anymore. Um, it's nasty stuff. But I consider it a tool in the arsenal. You know, it's um, so I, t I don't use it at any minute in the end. There's never a, a drop of pastel that you see on a finished piece. But um, I tend to use it as. Um, an agent to allow me to layer and layer um, and to darken certain passages so that I can put another layer on that then will give me more depth. Right. So that's unusual um, compared to what I've seen. That is unusual. Yeah, yes. compared yeah. to what I've seen with other people. Um, and then I also tend to use the entire range from very, very hard and, and pencils, not as much as people think, but uh, all the way up to the really, really soft, where it's like my, my dear friend John pretty much just uses soft pastel. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I do a lot of underpaintings as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. a lot of underpaintings, yeah. like blocking the composition. I always say if the underpainting doesn't work, the painting's not going to work. You have to have those basic shapes yeah. on there. I also spend a lot of time drawing that way. Right. Well, we have a really great audience here today. <laughs> so um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience, if anybody has any, or maybe we've covered everything. <laughs> yeah. I guess. You never and if you could project, when you ask a question, if you could project your voice really well. I guess you've never told me, Katie, after 45 years of knowing each other. <laughs> how did you transition? How did you go from you love pottery. How did you go to all of a sudden pastel is what I want to do? She had a pottery wheel. But I did pastel long before the pottery. Remember, I was doing I was in the gallery before I did the pottery. Um, and uh, the only reason I didn't continue the like I said, I have basically a secondary I have two concentrations basically, pottery and, and life drawing. Yeah. Oh, and stop not you know, but um uh, I couldn't get enough color. I'm a colorist. I just couldn't couldn't get enough color of pottery, and I and I I didn't like that I couldn't have as much control over it as I wanted to. Yeah. And we were using glass films, and it was like you never knew what was going to happen. You opened the film. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nope. No, that's not what I want. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not. Colorful. That's not. That's not colorful. That's <laughs> not what I want. So <laughs> that was pretty much it. So yeah, but, but I mean pastel. Pastel is a is both a drawing and a painting medium, and drawing is you know a, a love of mine. I think that's kind of you know that's why I, I still love everything. When I teach classes in drawing and design and acrylic thing, um, like pastel just allows me to say what I want to say more easily than anything else. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Oscar, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? She's I am. I have one for Nick. Do you start? How do you know what you're going to create? Do you have a Do you have a drawing and say, "I'm going to make a picture today," or I'm going to do a bowl? What, what? How do you come up with the project that you're going to build? Um, yeah, it's it, intentional. Yeah, it is very intentional. Um, when I sit down at the wheel for a day, I'll often start with mugs or cups, and I just know, all right, I'm going to make twenty to forty mugs or cups. 
and I get the I get the clay ready for that. I don't necessarily weigh everything, so things do change in height and shape and form a little bit, but that's kind of warm up. And then I go on to the next thing. Sometimes there's a list, and I just know, hey, there's a teapot for tomorrow, so I need to do some teapot or pitcher throw. But there are, you know, the variation or the things that are, I mean, every, really, I'm a very intentional maker. Every mark is very intentional. I, I'm not, like, I like a little bit of looseness. I like to loosen up on a, the foot line or the handle markings or, or things like this. Um, but in order to, um, you know, achieve a quality picture, throw well, light enough, I need to know what I'm going to make when I'm starting. So I can make the right choices down the line on that piece. On a pitcher, I want to make sure I'm leaving that rim nice and heavy so I can pull uh, a nice spout out of there. I want to make sure I'm pulling a little heavier or a little stronger than I would for like, uh, like a carved vase or a squared vase or a rectangular vase. Because on those, I'm going to pull more text, I'm going to pull more material out later. On a pitcher like this, it's just thrown and it's done. I want it to be very light. And now those of us who don't do this are completely intimidated by the thought of lifting these guys. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, you know, when you're picking or you still you end up with accidents and it's like, oh, that hurts. Do you have accidents that happen with clay? You know, yeah, not as much. Clay accidents are usually disasters. <laughs> in my, in my in the way I work. Um, you know, some potters work much looser than others. I work in it, I'm, pr I'm pretty tight. I make tight pots. Um, you know, I there were times where I felt that push and pull like I needed to make looser pots. Um, I remember chatting with Bill Gossman one time and being like, yeah, I'm really trying to loosen things up a little bit. And he looked at me and he's like, you don't make loose pots. <laughs> and at that, that moment, I was like, yeah, yeah he's right. I don't make loose pots. It's, so, yeah. Yeah. it's a hard thing becoming an artist sometimes and... and realizing you just are who you are and just give in like <laughs> you might admire other things or other ways that people work but if it's not you just stop fighting that's sorry your nature yeah. sorry to me it's okay to make that <laughs> is that a good answer yeah i was thinking when you said that too that there's there's probably a way when you start in a studio when you don't have as many commitments but when we're talking to professional artists it's not as romantic but to think that, like, you don't just every day go in and think, what do I feel like making? I mean, you might, but a lot of times you have, that gallery just called me and they're out of mugs. I have to make mugs and I have a teapot show coming up. And so there's a little bit of that. And mm -hmm. your gallery says you're having a show and you need to. Yeah. Right. Produce. My husband always says I work well under pressure. I really do. I, I, and I like the idea of a theme. I like to come up with a theme. Yeah. Even though it's a landscape, it's like this. It's fun when it's like, I love when you guys have theme shows and I get to make it. Like I love it. It's like, oh, what can I do for that? I, it's fun. It's like a challenge. How do you do the theme shows? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I do like theme shows. Obviously, it's easy when the theme is pictures um, <laughs> or teapots. It's a little harder when it's like uh, nostalgia or, yeah. you know, like, uh, how do you like artifact or, you know, but, you know, I don't have a lot of space or time in the studio to, to push into those realms. Right. And I, I wish I did. Yeah. Um, I do like the idea of trying to build conceptual um, themes into functional ceramics. It's not the easiest place to, to do that. Right. Um, you don't have imagery. Uh, so, I mean, I could, yeah. you know, put birds on things. You've got images. But, you know, it doesn't yeah. Yeah. drive yeah. concept right. like yes. other things do. Yes. The mention of accidents. And I know in, in watercolor, you know, can talk about the happy accident. Are there happy accidents in Pascal? No. no. <laughs> I, I think that there are, yeah, I, there probably are some, but I haven't had any happy accidents. Most of my accidents are like, oh man, I just made a mess on the floor. Yeah, yeah. I stepped on one of my six dollars piece pastels. Um, but um, no, I, I would not say that. And actually, you know, like that piece there with the yellow, I oh, yeah. there was that was a there was a different vein under it. Did I tell you this? No. There's an if they x rayed that there's an entirely different vein under that um, painting that it was completed and it was okay. 
but I, I kept looking at it in the studio and one day, I, I don't like this painting, and I turpentine washed over the entire thing and made a whole painting over it, um, which I was, I did in like two days afterwards. I Normally my works might turn that that's where I took me two weeks, but um, that one's sort of like, maybe that, maybe that's a happy yeah. accident when you just like, you have this kind of dirty surface now, and I just started, because of the shapes of the clouds, I needed to cover them up with the dark. So the so the real dark bottom. So I guess yeah, you're right. That that kind of was sort of an accidental thing to do a separate piece over the top. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Thanks cover for that question. We learned yeah, something really interesting. Covered up the dirt. The dirtiness. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you have occasions where you you almost are done with a piece of visual and you say this just isn't good enough. Toss it over. Well, you give it to a friend. <laughs> no, I break, no, I break them before. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Potters are notorious for breaking things that didn't turn out. Good. Yeah, I don't have a sharp style going. Standard for yourself, and then you have the tire thing of the tree from the gallery. <laughs> Typically, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I I do have a standard where, like, yeah, I can sell this. This is fine. Um, sometimes that's at the end of the process piece comes out, there's a little soft blister. It's not going to hurt anybody. Um, if you see wood fired pots, they're you're like sometimes they're crusty and have sharp edges on them. And you know, some of those potters are like, yeah, this is fine, just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, so like that doesn't make sense to have that much mess on my pots. But um, but yeah, there are times where I do get times where it's not like when I'm making new work, stuff that is maybe partially things I was doing before and I'm gonna try it again or I'm gonna um, you know I'm gonna try to add in a different kind of handle or hand build a little more. Sometimes those things do start on a sketchbook where I'll sketch old work and then I'll kind of do you know kind of uh, do sketches or iterations from there. Um, but yeah there are times where like I'm working on something and I just know it's not working and just goes right in the slot bucket and that becomes another pot system. Yes. Um, I have a question for Kate. Are your cloudscapes uh, a combination of uh, cloudscapes that you've seen in nature and taking your own photographs of, and or your in combination with your yes. imagination? They are um, actually, uh, so many people ask me this on Friday night. Um, Teresa actually asked me to do this show last September, I believe it was. Um, and my husband and I, when I said yes, and I realized I have a lot of work to do um, in a short period of time, because I'm not a fast painter generally, we went out um, driving and I felt like one of those storm chasers. My husband said, yeah, there's a tornado, go for it. Oh, that's what it felt like. But we, we, and we, I don't think we did it more than three times. Um, but each time we would, we, we drove long distances um, so that I could do photography. Um, but I'm also, my husband knows I do a lot of like just I'm always like Nick. I'm looking at nature all the time. I, I mean, I spent my childhood like looking at clouds, like a lot of people, but probably a little bit more, a little more than most average people. So um, these pieces are all combinations of my research. I call it research when I'm out taking photo photographs, but I also do a lot of color studies. They rarely look anything like the photos. The photos have become a catalyst. They're just an I just a reminder of how that form was, and quite often I combine multiple photos, um, parts of photos. So that's where the drawing you need to draw, know how to draw. So yeah, and some of them are just right from my imagination. That that square piece right there is strictly from my imagination. So um, that's the way it is. A little of everything. <laughs> Anything else before we? Well, I'm going to say, and you can all wander around the show and talk to these two, but I don't think we have to run out with you either. So you can have your own, you know, continue the conversation. Um, but um, this, thank you both so very, very much. This thank has you. been really great. The show is stunning. Um, so Atmosphere is in the gallery through July 23rd. There's two other shows up right now. There's a group show called Artifact. 
And then in gallery number five upstairs is a installation by Shell Isaac and DA Harrington called Homing Device. Um, but anyway, it's it's just an outstanding show and it looks gorgeous. Beautiful. So thank you. <laughs>